This is part one of my video cast to address keywords and phrases relating to diabetes. The keywords and phrases have been extracted from several years of in-training exams. As usual for my presentations, there will be very few slides containing solely words. Most will consist of illustrations, tables, or graphs to emphasize the points. It might be worthwhile for you to pause the presentation on some of the slides which present significant detail. The first keyword is the perioperative effects of insulin. I have racked my brain trying to figure out what kind of question can be written based on this keyword. The fact is that insulin acts the same way in the perioperative period as it does any other time. Here's a list of some of the more prominent actions of insulin. The next thing that occurred to me was that the question might be related to insulin resistance, which is known to occur as a consequence of increased cortisol and catecholamines associated with surgery. This slide lists some effects of insulin resistance. Note that the increase in procoagulant factors is a result of hyperinsulinemia and is not a direct effect of insulin resistance itself. Of these effects, the effect on nitric oxide is the most interesting from the perspective of anesthesia. Eventually, I decided to address the key word from the perspective of the surgical stress response. Stress, including that imposed by surgery and anesthesia, stimulates a cascade of responses. From the perspective of glucose control, most of these result in an increase in blood glucose. The increase in catecholamines results in a decrease in the release of insulin and an increase in the secretion of glucagon, both of which will result in an increase in serum glucose. Additional factors in the stress response include an increase in the release of cortisol and growth hormone. Cortisol increases hepatic glucose production and promotes gluconeogenesis. In addition, the combined effect of the stress response is to increase free fatty acid production. Increased levels of free fatty acids inhibit glucose uptake by the cells. The combined effects result in an increase in glucose production, a decrease in insulin release, and a relative resistance to insulin. This is the next item on the keyword list. There are at least three ways to view this keyword. The most obvious is to consider the complications of diabetes, both microvascular, for example, retinopathy, and macrovascular, for example, peripheral vascular disease. Diabetes is the leading cause of end-stage renal disease and adult blindness. It is also the leading cause of lower extremity amputations. It has been reported that the surgical mortality rate in patients with diabetes is five times that of patients without diabetes. This approach seems too obvious. The second approach would be to consider the direct effects of hyperglycemia, which may be the point of the question. The third approach would be to consider the complications associated with severe acute hyperglycemia, for example, diabetic ketoacidosis. At one point in time, hyperglycemia was considered advantageous for critically ill patients. The belief was that it provided an additional substrate for energy production. Subsequent work has documented that hyperglycemia is an independent risk factor for perioperative morbidity and mortality. Hyperglycemia is associated with a decrease in nitric oxide production and release, which leads to vasoconstriction with a consequent potential for compromised blood flow. It is also associated with a decrease in complement function and neutrophil chemotaxis and phagocytosis. The end result of these changes is to increase inflammation, increase vulnerability to infection, and increase the risk of multi-organ system dysfunction. The final approach is to consider the implications of severe acute hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome primarily occurs in conjunction with trauma or infection in patients over age 60 with type 2 diabetes. It is the initial presentation of type 2 diabetes in some patients. Generally speaking, the problem develops over weeks during a period of stress, for example, in the presence of an infection, with a persistent diuresis due to glycosuria. Although ketones are not formed due to continued secretion of insulin, a lactic acidosis may occur due to hypoperfusion. Mental obtundation or coma may occur due to hyperosmolarity. Vascular occlusion may occur due to low flow states. A good question about HHNS or DKA would be to ask about specific lab values in the two conditions. 
One thing not listed in this table is that serum electrolytes tend to be normal in patients with hyperglycemic hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome. In the presence of DKA, patients will tend to have hyponatremia and hypophosphatemia, and magnesium will have a tendency to be low. In the presence of lactic acidosis due to hypoperfusion, the values listed for pH bicarb and anion gap for HHNS may resemble those of DKA. Treatment of DKA is the next subject to be addressed. In addition to asking about the treatment of a patient with DKA, good questions would include inquiring about the etiology and assessment of DKA. From this slide, it should be evident that one-third of cases of DKA are due to mismanagement of the patient's insulin, and almost equal number are due to the presence of an infection. Patients with DKA generally have an increased anion gap acidosis. I want it duly noted that I despise the concept of the anion gap. I don't like it first because the very word gap tends to imply something abnormal. With that in mind, how can you have a normal gap? Second, I don't like it because there are two ways to calculate the value for the anion gap, with and without potassium. Finally, I don't like it because there are two different values for normal depending on which formula is used for the calculation. Because the metabolic acids are not used in the calculation of the anion gap, ketoacidosis is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Just to be clear, diabetic ketoacidosis results in an increased anion gap even if potassium is used in the calculation. Patients with DKA also commonly are hypotensive and tachycardic with some form of spontaneous hyperventilation. Quick small breathing consists of tachypnea with large tidal volumes and is associated with a metabolic acidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis is one of the most common causes of Kussmaul breathing. As noted on a previous slide, hypomagnesemia is a relatively frequent finding in patients with DKA. The etiology of hypomagnesemia in these patients includes pre-existing conditions such as poor dietary intake or increased gastrointestinal losses secondary to autonomic neuropathy. It may also be due to increased renal losses due to the osmotic diuresis or a shift of magnesium into the cells like potassium with insulin administration. A prolonged corrected QT interval, QTC, is the most common ECG manifestation of hypomagnesemia. Evaluation of a patient's cardiac status is also relevant in the presence of DKA. Although this slide demonstrates the increased risk of major vascular complications in patients with type 2 diabetes, it is useful to demonstrate the increased risk of acute myocardial infarction. DKA is associated with myocardial infarction either before the onset of DKA, since acute MI is described as the precipitating event in approximately 4% of cases of DKA, or during the episode, since DKA may result in increased myocardial oxygen demand, at least in part due to the increases in catecholamine output associated with acidosis. One word about serum sodium in the presence of increased blood sugar. Hyperglycemia results in a decrease in serum sodium of one milliequivalent per liter for every 62 milligrams per deciliter increase in blood glucose. This occurs as fluid is drawn from the cells into the intravascular space due to the osmotic effect of glucose. Accordingly, most patients with DKA will have a low serum sodium. It's important to remember, however, that the total body sodium will be normal. Some patients with DKA may present with hypernatremia due to the loss of free water through osmotic diuresis. Another abnormality in electrolytes may be hypophosphatemia. Studies have shown no benefit from treating hypophosphatemia in patients with DKA, but if the patient has respiratory failure, it's probably worth considering because muscle weakness is the primary manifestation of hypophosphatemia. This flowchart is a reasonable approach to the management of a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. It's described as the DKA approach, a useful mnemonic, to treat diabetic ketoacidosis. We'll go through the essential elements in some detail on subsequent slides. Delaying surgery to eliminate ketoacidosis is counterproductive if the surgical condition is creating the problem. 
Stabilization of the patient, however, is warranted. The first step in management is to treat the dehydration. The volume deficit is generally 3 to 5 liters, but may be as high as 10 liters. Volume expansion needs to be moderately aggressive. Most recommend replacing one-third of the deficit in the first 6 to 8 hours and the balance over the next 24 hours. Remember, patients with diabetes probably do not have normal ventricular function. In patients with a history of significant myocardial dysfunction, monitoring intravascular volume may be prudent. The second step is to treat the potassium deficit, which is commonly in excess of 3 milliequivalents per kilogram and may be as high as 10 milliequivalents per kilogram. Think about that. In a 70 kilogram person, you are talking 210 to as much as 700 milliequivalents of potassium. That obviously cannot be replaced quickly. Additionally, urine output should be restored before administration of potassium. This algorithm says the serum potassium must be corrected before insulin is administered. As previously noted, the potassium deficit is not something that can be corrected by potassium administration even in a day. Instead, I would say that the hypokalemia needs to be addressed prior to administration of insulin. Once insulin therapy is initiated, the serum potassium is likely to decrease as it moves into the cells. Remember, glucose and insulin are one of the treatments for hyperkalemia. The potassium is not lost from the body. In addition, however, as the intravascular volume is expanded, more sodium is delivered to the distal tubules of the kidney, resulting in potassium loss. Obviously, that potassium is lost from the body. Treatment of the acidosis begins with the administration of insulin. Most authors recommend an initial bolus followed by a continuous infusion. During the first two hours, with volume resuscitation, glucose levels may fall precipitously. In general, the maximum rate of decrease in serum glucose is about 75 to 100 milligrams per deciliter each hour. This occurs because there are a limited number of insulin binding sites. Once serum glucose declines to 250 milligrams per deciliter, glucose should be added to the IV fluids. As previously noted, DKA results in an anion gap acidosis. Factors contributing may include ketones from the ketoacidosis, lactate from hypoperfusion secondary to hypovolemia, or organic acids from renal insufficiency. Treatment of acidosis with sodium bicarbonate is controversial. On the one hand, increasing pH to greater than 7 clearly improves myocardial function. On the other hand, rapid correction of acidosis may cause central nervous system problems due to paradoxical worsening of CSF and central nervous system acidosis. This may occur as bicarbonate is converted to carbon dioxide and diffuses across the blood-brain barrier. Other contributing factors potentially involved in the paradoxical acidosis include decreased cerebral blood flow and development of osmotic gradients between the blood and brain. Now let's look at the perioperative management of hyperglycemia. Prior to 2000, it was common to not treat hyperglycemia unless the blood sugar was greater than 250. In 2001, the Vandenberg study reported a decrease in mortality in ICU patients if the serum glucose was maintained between 80 and 110 milligrams per deciliter compared with a target of 180 to 200. Despite many people pointing out the limitations of this study, for example, it was not possible in routine clinical care to duplicate the intensity with which the patients were monitored during the study, Several government agencies and the American Diabetes Association adopted the recommendations advanced by Vandenberg and used them as an indicator of quality. In the first few years after the Vandenberg study was published, a series of other studies were published which failed to document any difference in mortality, but did demonstrate that as many as 28% of patients managed according to the tight glycemic control guidelines developed significant hypoglycemia. In 2009, a study involving over 6,000 patients in over 40 centers was published. The study used an algorithm known as NICE-SUGAR 
which stands for Normal Glycemia in Intensive Care Evaluation, Survival Using Glucose Algorithm Regulation. That study documented that not only did adherence to the target of tight glycemic control result in an increased incidence of hypoglycemia, odds ratio 14.7, P less than 0.001, but also documented an absolute increase in mortality in these patients, odds ratio 1.14, P equals 0.02. Subsequent meta-analyses have reported no overall effect on mortality for patients managed along the tight glycemic control guidelines, but an absolute increase in the frequency of hypoglycemia. Current recommendations from the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the American Diabetes Association is that insulin infusion not be initiated unless blood sugar is greater than 180 and that once an insulin infusion is started, the target should be 140 to 180. This table is from an article in Anesthesiology published in 2017. You might want to pause the presentation here to review the table, but there are a few things that might simplify it. First, for everything other than the non-insulin injectables, the recommendations are not altered by whether or not the patient has had a bowel prep or clear liquids only for 12 to 24 hours pre-op. Second, if a dosage reduction is recommended, the recommendations are to give 80% of the usual dose. Finally, only for NPH insulin do the recommendations include a reduction in the morning dose.